Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, it's good to see familiar faces and also new faces joining us today. It, I, you know, one of the things that I like to emphasize in my care home is um, the idea of community. And hope I, I, the familiar faces here, I hope that you're beginning to kind of recognize other people that have come to our seminars and, and you can kind of perhaps chat about your respective situations because you'll find there's a lot of similarities between what we all go through in, in terms of planning for care. And um, ideally, you know, you're also learning from each other, not just from me, but learning from each other about what works, what doesn't work, how you uh, address certain things that come up or situations. Because while I have a lot of experience working with seniors and their families, you know, I, I, I'm just one provider out there. And, and really the community is a great source of support for each other. So, um, you know, continue to come to the seminars and, and if you see a familiar face, you can just say hello and, and go from there. Um, today's topic is about care priorities and um, I, I know there's some new faces here. So I'm just gonna do a little recap of, of where we've been prior to, but today's topic is actually quite important um, because it's, it, it's, it's almost the foundation of what we're looking for, how we go through this process. Um, I want to just uh, remind everybody that this seminar is sponsored by the Elderly Affairs Division, and it's um, uh, funded by the Federal uh, Older Americans Act. So thank you very much, Elderly Affairs, for sponsoring this. And um, do continue to provide good feedback on the evaluation so they feel that they'll continue to sponsor us for these seminars. Um, for some of you who haven't been to my seminars yet, I uh, myself am a care home owner. I've been doing that since uh, 2011, and my home is up in Manoa, caring Manoa. I have uh, a whole bunch of residents, and we help residents who have a very specific need, which is that they're uh, really unable to operate independently anymore. So they they need a lot of hands-on care with their um, activities of daily living. And, and because of that, because of that niche that I've created, you know, we do, I, I do say that my home is definitely not appropriate for many people. Um, it's important for care providers to know that about what they offer and what they maybe can't offer or won't offer so well, because uh, the more that we care providers can communicate that to you, the clearer you'll be about what services there are. Vice versa, today's topic about your care priorities is very important because then you won't necessarily need to be barking up the wrong tree if you're looking for a certain thing and um, the providers don't offer that, right? So it, it goes both ways and it's a very important thing. Um, but in 2013, 10 years ago now, I started doing seminars, just like you're attending today, uh, being able to help families navigate this process and understand what's out there. And, and it really started, the first seminar started um, as my elderly, um, what is it called? My uh, care options seminar, which is the next one coming up because that's the one where I think families, you know, typically just want to know what's out there. And uh, that seminar that's coming up is a great introduction to the whole spectrum of long-term care services we have here in the state. Um, but, you know, over the last 10 years, I've, I've met so many families that are lost or they don't know what they're looking for or the issues to think about. And so I, I started, you know, adding to this and it became a very formal thing, which now um, has, has culminated in a, a separate entity called Kupuna Care Pair, which is what you've attended or this seminar. And um, it's really not about my care home, rather about helping families generally think about long-term care and, and, and preparing for this. So um, we're right in the middle of our seminar series. Uh, this third one, deciding the key care priorities, as I mentioned, is very important for, I, I know that uh, several of you have attended the other two, the top five tips to find the best possible care fit, which was really looking at how one will jive or not jive well in a certain facility or with a caregiver at home or that sort of thing. Um, the second one that we did in June or no, June, what was it? May 
was important questions to ask potential caregivers. And I know some of you had really great questions during that um, after the seminar about, you know, gosh, I don't know what what I should be thinking in, in terms of evaluating this caregiver or not. And so those two seminars, if you miss them, are on my website. They're recorded. So you can watch the recordings and it's good to go back um, as well and, and kind of review because each one of these seminars is a little bit independent from each other, but they are also kind of sequential because um, once you know your care priorities that you really want to focus on, then you can look at what are the options and how would that fit with your priorities? You know, we could, we could want um, everything out of a caregiver or out of a care facility that we're looking for, but if it doesn't match what's actually available, then it's not gonna be that useful to us, right? And then the last um, seminar that I have in this series coming up is uh, extending care at home, which is a really big topic for most of us and really important because you don't want to think about having to move out of home until it's really the right time. But of course, there's also pitfalls to that. Okay, so that's our seminar series. Today's series, I mean, today's seminar about um, priorities is, is pretty important. And why it's important, you know, you can make these decisions very easily, immediately off the cuff. Well, I really want a caregiver who's going to just cook meals for me or, I really need a caregiver or a care facility that's going to give medications, right? And, and if we don't spend the time thinking about that, we can make those decisions very easily. But the pitfall to that is that if we prioritize the wrong aspects of care, then it might kind of come around and bite us in the okole. So, um, you know, it can lead to health decline or, or wasted time and money. Um, a lot of family strife, we see that quite often. And um, I know I've talked to some of you about that. So it's, it, it, it's, it's almost like an investment in your time to be thinking about this. Of course, if you're in a bind and you need to find a care facility or, or a caregiver really quickly, it's totally possible to do that. But you're all doing really well by coming to this seminar and attending it seemingly in advance before you're in a crisis mode of having to find something immediately. So that's, that's the importance of the care priorities and thinking ahead. Um, I, for those of you who have attended the seminars, you know that I kind of like these quizzes. So we're gonna do another quiz and it's just one question. Um, who gets to decide the key priorities for care? Okay, okay so, well, um, you have the senior, him or herself, or the spouse, or the kids, or the doctor, or the caregiver, or whoever has power of attorney, POA. So who thinks it's just the senior him, him or herself? Actually, all of them. Okay, actually all of them. How about the spouse? <laughs> the kids, the doctor, the caregiver, whoever has power of attorney. Okay, so, well, Sandy is onto it. She gave away the answer <laughs> immediately. Really, everybody gets to decide in a way. Now, somebody has legal authority to be the one to say, this is going to be it. But all of these people have a voice and all of these people have a say. And it's important to be able to incorporate them in this process. Otherwise, there are potentially issues that come up. And I know that I've talked to some of you about this when it comes to different um, people involved, right? And so that's the first thing about this um, that when you are deciding your key priorities there's these five steps oh yeah and I, I did print out the slides for, for you so you can follow along that way um, the first one is to identify the stakeholders which is the people we just talked about then the goals of care or the goal really and then uh, gathering and ranking your priorities then getting agreement from everybody, which could or couldn't be easy, depending on each of your situations, and then taking action. Okay, so we'll get into each one of these. Um, the stakeholders is, are the people we just talked about. The senior him and herself. Mom doesn't wanna move out of home, or mom, dad is um, you know, resistant to somebody coming into the home, right? That's, that's the senior who is potentially needing the care. You have, uh, the family, the spouses, anyone who will be affected by this, 
is considered a stakeholder as that that's what it's called and or maybe they will affect the change or they will affect who we decide to choose for a caregiver and that sort of thing so anyone that is involved with that is considered a stakeholder and and they have a voice whether you like it or not some people might not like that <laughs> i know some people do now do they have any formal roles and responsibilities i mentioned power of attorney that's a legal role for somebody to decide something on behalf of a person who can no, can no longer decide for themselves, right? And, and in the, um, what's called the advanced healthcare directive, we often have, you know, th that's the purpose of that document to give somebody else legal authority to decide on behalf of, you know, their loved one or their, whomever that is. Um, but stakeholders may also wield power over other stakeholders. Does anybody have siblings here? I know that there's some siblings that are louder than other siblings, or some, in my case, I have an oldest sibling that thinks that she's still the, you know, the boss after, well, she gave it up after about 30 years, but, you know, every sibling has uh, a different kind of level of power over each other, and, and same for the stakeholders, right? People do respect and, and put stock into the opinion of the doctor, say, right? So what kind of power do they wield over each other? Um, the stakeholders all have different concerns, different personal motivations, different stakes involved, maybe baggage. Uh, you know, this one person might not want to spend the money on the care. Somebody else might think that the care is not adequate, and so they have a different concern about it. And juggling all these concerns and stakes and motivations can be a little bit messy. Um, People have different communication styles. They also have different decision-making styles, right? So some people are very indirect in their communication. Others will go bluster right through and say, well, I'm the, you know, I'm the oldest sibling, so I get this. And, and they're gonna um, just steamroll through, right? And we talked a little bit about this last seminar on, on um, gosh, setting expectations and everything. And then decision-making styles. Some people really need to kind of chew on something for a while. You know, the, the, the term ruminate is to actually like means to chew something and you're kind of ruminating about, well, what should we do? And other siblings, I, I keep thinking about siblings, but let's say, you know, um, if, that's my, if that's my dad and he's thinking and thinking and maybe dragging his feet about what we should do about mom's care, you know, that decision-making style might be a little too slow or maybe he's putting off the decision. Right? So everyone's got different styles there. And different people have different tolerance for ambiguity, you know, not knowing the future. Some people have a different tolerance for, for complexity. They don't want to think about all these details. And I, I know that somebody who has a low tolerance from, for complexity may get completely overwhelmed by these seminars because I'm bringing up all these new things that maybe they weren't thinking about. So stakeholders are you know, very, very important in part of the process of identifying, you know, what is most important when it comes to thinking about the care for our loved one. And um, the more stakeholders, the more difficult the process can get. This says suddenly the second chair, granite rocks, jealousy of the first chair, granite rock becomes uncontainable. Boom, and he hits at the far side. I love that comic. But, you know, there's, there's emotions involved with this oftentimes, especially when there's history. And there are families who end up having to hire, you know, a third party professional, which can maybe be the best thing. Um, who, you know, that third party professional will, will cut through all the narratives or cut through the, um, they, they maybe be able to mediate the different opinions involved, right? And so the more stakeholders, the more complicated this can get. If there's mom, and we have to think about dad's care and then my siblings and then oh auntie so-and-so has actually been like the caregiver for a long time um vice versa if there are few stakeholders it's easier to make decisions but it's also easier to make mistakes and and to not necessarily have that diversity of opinion can can uh get us into trouble too so who are the stakeholders that's a very important part of this five-step process we're talking about because we're going to have to work with them whether you like it or not and um if they're 
if they don't really have the power to affect the decision, and maybe they're somewhat affected by it, but really not that badly affected, then they're not really a stakeholder. So these are really, I mean, you, you wanna narrow down the list of stakeholders as you're going through this. Okay, so that's the first step is to identify who is involved. Once we know who's involved, then we want to look at the goal of what we're trying to accomplish. And typically, it falls into one of these three categories. Now, we, uh, it, it, in my first seminar about the best possible care fit and the top five tips, we talked about a lot of um, you know, the, the different services out there and how that fits with your own needs and that sort of thing. But typically, one of these three things is the main goal of the care. Are we responding to something that's just come up and blown up in our face? Uh, and or, you know, it's an emergency. Let's say dad has fallen now and we have to look at um, getting care for him now that he's at home, right? Or, you know, out of the hospital. So addressing an emergency is, is one of the hardest situations to be in because it's, it's so urgent and it happens quickly. And if that's the goal, then your time frame in this decision-making process may be shorter. And we're gonna talk about that. But if it's also to maintain the status quo, then maybe it's not as urgent. And well, I should say, you know, oh, no, no, it's not as urgent. And maintaining the status quo is really um, a, a good position to be in where then the stakeholders are not maybe so, um, energized, they're not so emotional perhaps, and it's, it's more a matter of how do we extend mom's time at home? How do we make little tweaks, right? What are the goals there? Um, and then the third frequent goal is either to improve or change the situation, which is more forward thinking. It's, it's, it's more sometimes proactive before we need it. Um, sometimes you have to make a change simply because you're forced to, but it's not an emergency. So understanding which one of these three categories you're falling into when you develop these priorities is important because um, you don't want to prioritize something that is going to, say, maintain the status quo when really we need to make a change. And I know a lot of seniors fall into this category where maintaining the status quo feels more comfortable than making a change. I mean, not just seniors, everybody. Making changes feels really difficult at times. But if you're, everyone has to be on the same page about what we're trying to achieve here. And if we're not, then before even getting into the specifics about the different priorities involved, we need to all be on the same page that Look, it's no longer for, safe for dad to be waking up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet. We can't just have status quo where he's all by himself living alone. And so any potential solutions that come up or priorities that come up that are trying to maintain the status quo when there's a safety issue, we can't do that, right? So step one, know who's involved. Step two, now we can really identify what is it we're trying to achieve here? And then step three, I apologize, gets a little complicated. So I wanted to start with something a little bit more fun at first. Step three is to gather and then rank all the different care priorities, which is what we're talking about today. The care priorities uh, we'll get into, but the, the rhetorical question I have here is what is the ideal number of choices that we should have when we're thinking about this kind of thing? Uh, I'm sorry, it's not on the slides here, but what is the ideal number of choices? The, I mean, the, the true answer is there's no ideal number. Everybody's different. But I wanted to give some examples. Uh, I think a lot about food. So here's an example of a menu. Uh, this is the Cheesecake Factory, and this is like half their menu, okay? There's like seven pages and then they have eight more pages plus a specials menu and all kinds of things. Is that the ideal number of choices? Some people would say, absolutely. Other people may say, gosh, you know, I'm really overwhelmed by that. And when, when we talk about stakeholders, everybody has different thresholds for this, right? What about this? Okay, we're on an airplane. There's a little picture of a chicken head or a fish with a carrot. 
How about that? That makes it pretty simple to decide. But is that the ideal number of choices, right? And, and everyone, again, you're going to have to hash this out, unfortunately, with anyone else who's involved. But here's another example. And then the third example. This is a store that only sells medium white t-shirts. OK, well, that's easy. Great. <laughs> That's actually, and this is a, um, it's actually not a real store. It's an art installation that my wife was involved with. Uh, after Obama finished the presidency, he said, I just want to sit in a shack and only sell medium white t-shirts. No decisions to have to make, right? Sometimes we really feel overwhelmed by all of this complexity, by all of the choices, by having too many options. And, and some people really would rather wait till the emergency happens to then say, okay, I'm forced to make this change. That could work. The problem is that maybe the options are fewer, but it could work, right? If I'm, for, if I, if I'm putting off caring for dad at home and then he falls and fractures something, I don't have any other option but to take him probably to the hospital. That's my medium white t-shirt. But at least I know and I have the certainty that that was the right choice. That was the only choice, but that was the right choice in that moment. So um, we all have different kind of ideas of what's most ideal. Maybe that's not ideal. <laughs> maybe this is not ideal and maybe this is not ideal, but somewhere in there, it works for you and for the other stakeholders, right? So when you are gathering all of these priorities and I'm gonna go into kind of defining what a priority is, we want to first define how long we're thinking about it for, because you know if I have a if I have a, a parent who's in his or her mid seventies or early eighties, then that's a much different time frame than if my my auntie is in her late nineties. We're looking at two very different different kind of scenarios. And so we want to first define, you know, the period of time that we're actually trying to make these decisions. Once we do that, then we want to identify all desired care factors, which is something I'm calling a care factor is different from a care priority. And I'm going to go into that, but we want to just get it all together and really start to pick apart. Okay. What's most important here. And once we have the care factors identified, then we determine if those factors are really truly priorities or not. Lastly, everybody gets a chance and everybody in, who's a stakeholder gets a say of how to define this and then you come together. So the more care factors that you choose and the more care priorities that you choose, the more complicated it's gonna get. We're gonna be in Cheesecake Factory menu if we have too many. Uh, so it's, it's really one of these balances. Now, well, I'm gonna go into the specifics and, and you all, um, there's a handout there which um, can really help you through this process if you don't have it. Defining the care period and what we're looking for. The, it's the period of time, have a seat, have a seat. It's a period of time where it's, it's foreseeable, we can predict it, right? So the foreseeable time frame before the next change in health status, before the change, next change in financial status or some other status that requires us to change our plans or, or modify the care, right? So um, that example I mentioned about having say a parent in, my, in mid or late 70s versus having a parent who's in the late 90s, um, the, the parent in the late 70s is going to have several more care periods to look at than the one in the late 90s, presumably. I mean, I have a 106-year-old in my home right now, and, and I think her family probably thought, well, you know, we're in the last period, but the period probably keeps extending, right? So the foreseeable future. Now, if you can't anticipate this, you know, what are some of those changes going to be? And, you, and, and you're not really seeing any changes that are gonna occur unless you're looking at sort of an end of life situation. I, I'm sorry, but you gotta, you gotta really do some soul searching on this and, and explore the situation further because there are always changes, right? Even 
even uh, between days or months, everyone's situation changes over time and it will force you to have to modify the plan, right? But how long is the care period? And this is the first step when you're looking at defining the priorities. I have a, a worksheet that is available there and there's one online. And this worksheet really helps you to just kind of put down, there's only three, but you, you, know, you can do this for as many periods as you can anticipate. But, you know, really sit down and summarize, okay, for this immediate, and, and you don't really have to do it so far in advance, because unless you know the future, which none of us really do, then maybe you'd have to just think about the next period. But summarize what exactly, which one of those three goals we're looking at, is this to maintain the status quo? Is it to address an emergency? Or is it to really make a change? You know, what is the goal? What are the care needs in this time period? You know, basically, you know, basic stuff like any health diagnosis, any um, situation about the care setting, like, you know, uh, here's the home that we live in and, and that's the only asset or, um, you know, the care arrangement, maybe um, dad is at a assisted living facility right now. And really as much as you can just sort of list out what is this period looking like? What do we want out of this current period of care? Because then you go to the next category, which is what is gonna make a change? And again, we don't have the crystal ball, but some people have conditions that if there is a silver lining to it, you know that it's progressive. Alzheimer's and dementia, Parkinson's, um, any sort of neurodegenerative thing, um, MS, you know, that kind of stuff. There's a, those are all horrible situations and diseases, but the silver lining is there's research out there to kind of inform you of maybe the future steps or future care needs. So let's say a Parkinson's, for instance, if I, if my dad has Parkinson's and he's at home and right now he's still independent, maybe has a little bit of issue mo with mobility, has some dexterity issues grabbing the fork and spoon. Maybe he's beginning to not be able to swallow so well. These are all things we know about Parkinson's. The triggers to throw me into a whole new care period would be something like maybe dad can no longer swallow well. Maybe dad is beginning to fall. Maybe that is beginning to um, make poor decisions associated with Parkinson's. And so really identifying what are the things that are gonna force us into having to change? You know, we, we all, I, I hear it from families when they, when they say, I, I saw the assisted living facility um, at Kahalanui and they had this great facility and then they had the nursing home and all of these services. And so all I need to do is take mom put her in that facility, and then that's it, right? She can live out the rest of her life there. But that's not the case, unfortunately. There's things that will throw that plan out of whack. Triggers, uh, common triggers could be death of a spouse. Common triggers could be maybe the financial situation drastically changes. Um, other triggers could be that the support network has fallen through. Maybe my, you know, my one child who I've been depending on has now moved to the mainland. And so there's a lot of triggers that, you know, we don't, we can't even anticipate in the future, but the more you can anticipate what those triggers are, because you can kind of get a sense of like, okay, we're really looking at dad's care, but gosh, mom just got diagnosed with congestive heart failure. Um, the more you can anticipate that, then you'll be able to better prepare what is going to be the next period and the goals for the next period and the, 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 the setting of the care should it you know if in that example if dad has alzheimer's and now mom has congestive heart failure can they both still stay at home not sure right and so understanding how long we're looking for once you have that summary of the goals and then the triggers then maybe 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 you can put a time frame to the period let's say okay rough sketch the next two years that's our time period or if uh, dad fell, he fractured his hip or leg or something, now he's in short-term rehab. Then that period is short. It's maybe just a matter of weeks. And once he's discharged from the hospital and maybe discharged from short-term rehab, now we have to look for something else. 
in the immediate term, our care period is a few weeks, but further beyond, we're going to have to already think about the next period. And, and that trigger for the first period is getting discharged from the hospital, right? So this is the first step as you're looking at specifically, okay, what should I prioritize over you know, one thing over another? Is it the finances? Is it the care? Is it my, maybe my personal preferences? And the second step <clears throat> to gathering and, and ranking your care priorities is to look at care factors. This is, some, this is attributes that are before priorities. Now we all have care factors in our life. This is something, I mean, you know, if you Google it, it may come up with something else, but what I'm calling care factors, there's kind of three main categories, something related to actual needs, something related to the setting, the environment, the comfort, the location of where this care is being offered. You know, it could be at home, it could be in a facility, it could be at the hospital, and then other types of services that don't have anything to do with actual care, but are important, like who's going to make meals? How are we going to get dad to the doctor's appointment? Um, who's going to you know, give him the medications? These are, these are other services or other you know, aspects of the care. So we all have these things that are uh, attributed to all, of, you know, even now, all of us are pretty independent or mostly independent. And so right now, these are not priorities for us. But over time, as our situations change, and we need to start thinking about care, then those attributes are going to start to come to the fore in the next, you know, I don't know, year, two years, 10 years, whatever that time period is. So the care factors, I have a whole list on the paper in front of you. And, and these are just the most common categories. I mean, obviously everyone's situation is different. It's gonna vary from me to you. It's going to vary from you to your spouse or you to your sibling, right? Even, I mean, spouses have very different attributes for their needs. And this worksheet, you can just kind of highlight, well, what sounds most important for me in this period of time? Uh, let's say the period of time, and we go back to that example of dad falling, fracturing his leg, and then being in the hospital and then short-term rehab then you know, there's all of these different types of uh, potential factors here. And for dad, <clears throat> you know, is it important that he stays together with a spouse? Mm, well, he's at the hospital, so maybe he can't stay together with a spouse. Is it important that dad goes shopping right now at the hospital? No. Um, is it important that he has a lot of socialization at the hospital? Uh, maybe if he's starting to get really confused. So. Each one of these categories, it's not that you have to write something for each one of these. The, the, the key is something in here sounds important to you or to your loved one, right? Um, I really need mom to be in a facility that's close to me. I don't want to drive more than, say, 10 minutes. That becomes a, a care factor that I think is a priority, right? And so uh, on the worksheet, you can just kind of look through it and write down Okay, if it's related to the amount of mental stimulation, what exactly is it that you think dad needs in that mental stimulation? Does he need somebody to be with him chatting for you know, hours a day? Or does he need to be just sitting in front of the TV all day? The answer is no, <laughs> nobody should be doing that. Or does the mental stimulation mean that dad needs to just kind of like say, go to Zippy's for an hour every you know, couple of days and, and meet with friends? So, but yeah, I mean, like everyone's situation is different, but in each one of these here, whatever kind of calls out to you when you're thinking about, again, we're, we're thinking about dad who's fractured his leg and he's in the hospital and in rehab. So it's not gonna last that long. You know, maybe of all this list here, um, I need care that's available now because he's gonna be discharged and I need it within the next like two weeks because that's what the hospital has told me dad's moving out in two weeks or maybe i need like a location that's going to be close to home because mom now wants to see dad every day that he's out of the hospital and um it's going to be important for us to have that right this looks very complicated but if you 
think about what's important for your loved ones, say, for dad, I guarantee it fits into one of these categories. So um, you, the process, step two is just to write down, just write it, just get it out of your mind and put it on paper and say, all of the things that I think are important for dad or for my spouse or for my own personal care, just write it down on paper. From there, we go to the next step. And, and sorry, the more specific you can be, the better. So if it's, um, if we're talking about location, again, like, you know, let's say I, I only want to be looking for something in the Kaimaki area, say, like, you know, or within, you know, X minutes of this one location, the more specific you can be, the better. Finally, once we gather all this, you know, you sweep it all together on the, on the table, then you want to qualify does each factor actually mean a priority? Is this actually important to us? Or is it just something that I like? You know, do I, is, it, is it crucial that dad is in a facility in Kamaki if I live in Kamaki? Or is that just a nice to have thing, right? And I, you know, this, this, is, um, this is kind of a very technical explanation of something that we do every day. Like if you go to a restaurant to order something, it's, I, I'm feeling hungry. Okay, I'm going to go get something. I'm going to go to, um, you know, Panda. And then I see all the options and I'm going to choose, well, I like chicken. I can't, I'm allergic to string beans and these things. So like, I'm just going to order, right? All of that happens in our mind very quickly. But when you're involved with other people, they're not going to read your mind. They're not going to know your thought process. And so it's important to kind of take these steps and actually, you know, externalize it, put it on paper. So all these things that we think are important for dad's care, is it really a priority or are we just thinking that's a nice to have? So in order to qualify it and evaluate it, you answer these three questions. One, two, three. Is it really critical for some stakeholders' well-being? Right Now, well-being could be their physical care, it could be the emotional state. It could be that the stakeholder just has promised dad 30 years ago that I'm never going to move him into a care facility. That was the promise I made to him, right? Like, is it really that critical to the stakeholder? And we have to, we have to really think critical, not like, is it important? Is it um, a nice to have? Like, it has to be super, super important. Because if it's not, then it's just going to complicate this process, right? The, we're going to go back into Cheesecake Factory territory. Um, so is it super critical for the stake, any of the stakeholders' well-being? If it is, okay, yes, great. Will it be safe? Will it encourage safety generally? So, um, you know, dad's priority might be that he's getting out of the hospital, and he wants to go home. That's important to him. That's critical to him, in fact. He has lived in this house for 50 years and he does not want to move out. That is very critical to dad. But is it really going to be safe for him? Is it going to encourage that safety? And if the answer is no, that really might not have to be a priority in this, right? It's a, it's a hard pill for dad to swallow. But safety is a huge aspect of all of this. Now, there's, there's in-betweens, right? Dad maybe could live at home and then have a private caregiver come and help him there. But um, for the sake of your decision-making process, you really want to narrow down as many things as you can. So if it's going to be safe, if it's going to encourage you know, a safe environment, or be, have safety, then great. Dad really wants to stay at home, and it's going to be safe because... Um, Mom is there to take care of all his needs. Sometimes I see, I see that situation often. And unfortunately, mom starts to decline. But if it's critical and it's safe, then you go to the next one, which is during this care period, can we actually afford it, right? Let's look at that example again. Dad has fallen. He's fractured his leg. He's going to get discharged from the hospital in two weeks' time. He wants to go home. He really, really is adamant about staying at home and living out his days there. It will be safe because mom will take care of him. But can we really afford it? And 
in, in previous seminars, I've talked about affordability a little bit, but cost. Cost is not just money, right? Cost is also emotional health or emotional currency, social capital. You know, if, if I'm having to ask favors of other people, then they get really kind of tired of that over time. And so can we really afford the cost during this next period? Well, dad's plan is to move home and live for the rest of his life. Let's say dad's like 85 and um, it can be safe, but we're gonna, in order for it to be safe, we need to hire a caregiver to come inside because mom can't do this all night. Mom needs her own you know, life and, and care. So the cost is gonna be something like, 30, maybe $40 an hour for a private caregiver to come and, and be there while dad's there, right? Can we afford it for this period? Well, dad's care period is forever. Dad's care period is until he passes away. So is that gonna be affordable? If, if the care period was better defined, like, okay, it's just the next two weeks because dad is at the hospital and now he needs to transition. Maybe the answer is yes. But if the answer is no, to any one of these three, we're getting into the territory where this is maybe not a priority that you should be focusing on. Again, it, it could be a nice to have, and maybe we make decisions on nice to haves, but it just kind of moves you further away from perhaps something that is very important or might come back around in the future and bite you in the butt or um, you know, potentially lead to other issues in the future. So the answer has to be yes to each one of these things. And again, the, an example of a care priority, we talked about, um, well, you know, I think that dad needs to be living in the Kaimuki area. If the answer is yes, great. That factor gets put onto the next step, step three. And I'm really, I, I'm very proud of all of you for <laughs> or living, uh, going through this with me. Oh yeah, this is the, this is the um, worksheet I mentioned. So you can use this as you're kind of thinking through the process. You just list out every single thing that's important, whether it's important or not, really. You'll, you'll figure out right now. So we want dad to be in common key. Dad wants to be, you know, staying at home. I need a private caregiver at night. And then you answer yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And if it's yes, 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 great. If there's a single no anywhere here, then you might want to cross it out, right? Or just star it and say, this is not going to be on the top list. So the next step then is ranking all of those priorities, okay? We know that it's important. We know that this is something we should be thinking about. So the next bunch of questions about it is how urgent is this priority? That's like the number one, okay? Like um, if there's a fire in front of us because dad has fallen and fractured something, that is super urgent. There's no other options. He has to get some medical care, right? But other urgency could be, you know, a little bit less e easy to define. Like, you know, mom has, um, she was at the mall and she tripped and she fell and she said she was okay. But I noticed that, you know, she's kind of limping and, and lately she's been walking with a little bit funny gait. I don't know how urgent that is, but you want to have to rank it. And, uh, and I'll show you the example. How inflexible is this? So inflexibility, again, we're not, we're trying to narrow down things. So how inflexible is dad? Dad is saying, I'm not moving out of home, right? Try trying to convince him otherwise. It's important to try to convince dad, but if he is super, super, super duper inflexible that he has to stay at home, then maybe that's kind of higher up on the list of these priorities that we're looking at. And um, from there, this is a big one that's hard to swallow sometimes. Is this really a need or is this priority a want? Is dad's desire to stay at home a need or a want? It might be a need because maybe there's uh, budget issues or it might be a need because his soul, his, uh, mom's sole existence and reason for living is dad. So it could be a need. But dad staying at home and most seniors wanting to live at home through the end of life sometimes really falls into the category of want, not need. So that's the third one. And then the fourth criteria you use is 
Will it maintain, improve, or undermine our options in the future? Dad staying at home. We have to hire a caregiver for $30 an hour, six hours a day. That's going to add up to like, you know, nine or 10,000 a month at least. Is that going to undermine our options in the future? Because now all of that money we spent on a private caregiver to come to the house cannot be used for him going to a facility that's going to be, you know, providing round the clock care. So the, the answer to these is, is all in relation to each other. Um, a lower ranked need really should be prioritized before a higher ranked want. Dad wants to stay at home. That's, he's very inflexible about it. We need to find something because he's moving out of the hospital. So it's very urgent, but we can't afford it or he's not going to get the care. So really he needs to be in a facility. Being in the facility is lower on his list of priorities, but that outweighs or that um, you know, invalidates his higher ranked want. So that's the idea there. And, and here's the, the framework you can use again. You list out all your priorities, hopefully from the factors where we had so many of them, you know, everything gathered on the table. We then sweep it together and then we start picking out pieces of it to become the care priorities. So hopefully we have fewer priorities because the more there are, the more complicated. And then we start ranking. So let's say there's five. Let's say you fill out each one of these. Then the urgency you rank by the most urgent. Number one is the most urgent. Number five or however many there are is the least. And you can't do like, you know, two of them are one. You have to really just force yourself to say, okay, number <clears throat> the, the dad staying at home is number one urgency. Us hiring a caregiver while he's at home is maybe number two urgency or something like that, right? You, you rank them. Then you rank how inflexible it is to maybe do something different. Can we have dad move somewhere else? Is that, a, is that an option or not? If dad's very inflexible, then again, that might be the number one for inflexibility. And so you go through all your priorities and then you rank it by how urgent it is. If there's any other options, if there's no other options, then it's, then it's the most inflexible. Then you say, is it a need or want? And then you say, you tell yourself, does it maintain, improve, or, or jeopardize your future options there, right? With this, there's, it's, it's not like a, a mathematical formula, but it's a way for you to then say, okay, the final rank of all of these priorities I have is, I know dad wants to stay at home. He's told me that. Auntie so-and-so promised him 30 years ago that she would never move him to a facility. But budget is tight. We can't afford a caregiver for $30 an hour for so many hours a day. It's going to jeopardize our ability to move him to a facility because we're going to lose our, you know, we're going to spend all that money. And so really the final rank of dad that one priority, dad moving back home and staying at home is going to be lower on this. That's kind of how you do this. Now, again, we do this in our minds just instantaneously, but this is a framework and this is like a, a form that you can use to get it all on paper so that it's uh, when the time comes that things get a little bit emotional, it's easier for you to explain because the next step to all of this is where, you know, the fireworks happens or where there's contention or where, you know, stuff comes up, right? So if you can get it down on paper and you have, a, you know, you have your thought process and your reasoning behind it, great. You've got that. And now all the stakeholders come together. So let me take a quick breath here because I know that was a lot. Woo! <laughs> okay. Uh, what I just mentioned, step three, is all on that sheet that I gave you. And um, it's, I, I guarantee, I mean, it looks complicated, but you do it now in your mind. And it's just a, a, a sort of a, a framework that you can use. And uh, this is available online too. So you can print out more copies uh, from my website and everything. You would give this to each stakeholder. 
And, and ideally, every stakeholder does this. Mom does it, dad does it, the doctor is probably not gonna spend the time to do it. But um, one thing you have here is today's date, the current care period, let's say, you know, for the next two years or whatever, and then when you need to reevaluate this by. That's all looking into the future. But if you can anticipate as much as possible, you know, those things, then you can, you can, you know, set a, put it in your calendar that in like eight months time, we're going to have to redo this or reevaluate this. Okay. So again, it's, it's just a framework. If you want to just shoot from the hip and say, you know what, I got it. This situation that we're talking about, this is, this is how I would maybe have approached the situation prior to being in elderly care. Dad is getting, you know, dad's in the hospital. He has a fracture. He's going to get discharged in two weeks time. I got it. Dad's just going to move to my sister's house. And that's it. We're done. We decided the priority, right? That's how I would have thought before. So, okay. <clears throat> Step three is, is where a lot of the, a lot of the kind of brain work happens. Step four is where a lot of the fireworks happen. Okay, this is something that somebody told me once, and I, I, I really like it because it's, um, I, I try to live my life remembering this. It's really hard, but the, 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 the literal translation of to decide comes from Latin, two words, off and to cut. And so the literal translation of deciding is to cut off something, to close the door on something, to say this is no longer an option. And that's kind of scary for us. You know, I, I mean, I personally love to keep options open. I think that my wife complains that that means I'm dragging my feet, or it seems like I'm dragging my feet when no, I just I'm keeping all my options open, right. <laughs> but the, the literal Latin root definition to decide is to cut off and close the door on things that maybe are nice, maybe are comfortable but it's just not going to be appropriate, right? That's the fireworks. Yeah, I mean, it, even for myself, right? Like I, you know, I have to cut off, cut myself off when I'm eating ice cream sometimes. Like I, you know, that, I, oh, well, oh, don't do that. But like, gosh, my doctor is telling me, you got to start taking statins and stuff. So like closing the door on something doesn't feel good getting somebody else to close the door on something they want is even harder, right? And that's where this is a challenge, the fireworks, yeah, that's right. And I, I, I mean, I, Vera, we've talked about this, I think, right? Like it's, it's um, you get into family contention and all of that, right? So step four, you know, 4th of July display, the first step is to communicate with all the stakeholders and just get it all out, hash it out. What are your concerns about this situation with dad moving back home with this fracture and his plan is mom is going to take care of him. And, and then overnight, we're going to pay $30 an hour for a caregiver. Like everyone in that list of stakeholders, mom, dad, siblings, maybe the doctor, are going to start to have to kind of communicate about this, whether you like it or not. Now, you don't have to actually, let me take that back. You could also just make this decision for dad and not include anybody. But that might lead to other issues, right? Somebody's going to come back around and say, well, how come I didn't, you know, get consulted about this? We see that in the community every day, right? Like, uh, Somebody wants to build a playground somebody, somewhere. Somebody wants to build a rail system somewhere. Somebody wants to build a senior housing you know, in the back of Manoa. People want to be heard. They want that opportunity. Even if they don't really you know, have a, a legal say, they want to be part of that process. And if they're not part of that process and you push ahead, then as you know, there could be lawsuits. There could be just emotions, bad blood. I, I mean, I see this even in my, in my care home where siblings don't talk to each other. One sibling said, okay, thank you for the tour. We're going to think about it. And the other sibling just a few hours later says, we're doing it. We're moving mom in. Well, what just happened? Like, you know, did you talk about it? No, they did it. So 
you know, it's, um, it's challenging. And we go back and we bring up, we dig up all the baggage. We really get into the, the depths of our relationships here. But everyone has to just get it all out and hash it out. And then from there, you all brought your lists of care priorities, right? The, the oldest brother lives on the mainland. He brought his list. There's one priority on it. Move dad to my sister's house. My sister, I mean, the sister has this whole list of priorities that says, well, you know, who's going to take care of dad at night? Who's going to do these things, right? And you all have to negotiate from that point, which is not easy. And, and we're not talking, we're not getting into how you do it, you know, because honestly, every family is different. And I, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to do it myself sometimes. How do I negotiate with my wife or my, my siblings and that kind of thing? But here are the steps. And once you, once you all have your care priorities, you know, in the, in the first seminar I mentioned, you know, if there's too many cooks in the kitchen, one thing you could do is everybody just gets one priority, maybe two at most, okay? And then from there, maybe it kind of, you're deciding, you're cutting off, you're closing the door on, on all the wants that I have, or maybe even other priorities, so that then we can push ahead, we can break like, this log jam and decide what are we gonna do with dad's care because he's getting out of the hospital in two weeks. Realistically, the power, the person with power of attorney does have the legal authority to break any ties and that's actually their role. But that can be problematic too, as I'm sure you've heard of examples and that kind of thing. But there, they, as everyone should agree on this, they should be the tiebreaker because they're on the hook. They're the one that they're, you know, on the, the legal form for it that they have to decide. But it's not going to make dad feel any better if he has to move out of the house. So, you know, this is, uh, um, congratulations if you make it through this process. But I have to say, the more you can do this up front and in advance before you're in the crisis mode, the easier it gets, right? So that's why we want to give you this whole system and framework and all this stuff. I mean, um, if I'm going to the restaurant and I just want to order something off the cuff, that's so easy for me to do. But then, you know, I bring the food home and my wife says, well, wait a minute. I mean, so-and-so can't eat chicken or something like that, right? So you can be impulsive in this decision-making process, but it's sometimes a lot better to be a little bit more methodical and somewhere in between is a good balance. So that is the fourth step and the most important step. And then from there you take action. Okay, we've decided here are the priorities that we need. Dad, dad has to move out of the house. That's a priority, but to make him happy, we're gonna have somebody take them out of the care facility three times a week. Here's the plan, that's the priority. These are the, you know, priority number two is outings three times a week from there, right? So you, you're kind of sketching out and negotiating, you know, who's gonna get what. And then from there, once you have that all framed out, you already know that, okay, it's probably a safe plan. It's not just a want, it's, these are important things that you need, right? We talked about all of that here. It's critical and um, we can afford it, right? So don't delay once you do that because once everyone starts saying, well, wait a minute, I, you know, I didn't speak up during that meeting and now I feel sour about it. That person comes around, they, they always you know, are there. So <laughs> if, you, if you get to step five, push ahead, you know? Imua, like it's, it's, you got to do it. Well, the sourpuss didn't speak up, right? I mean, look, that was the time we all talked about this. <laughs> but sourpuss is going to come back no matter what, right? Even dad, dad's not happy about moving out of the house. It's not something he wants. But the reality of it is it's a priority, you know? So nobody's, you know, I mean, like, it's a magical thing maybe a, a pipe dream that everybody's happy in this, right? Never happens, hopefully. If there's just one child doing all the work, maybe it's a little easier, yeah. But even, you know, I mean, it's not just you, Nita. It's like your two parents. So, okay, now the other part is you actually gotta find 
the options and the care that you're looking for now. Now that you know these priorities, is it does it even exist? <laughs> like, is there a caregiver who will come to my house for less than you know twenty dollars an hour? I mean, twenty is your yeah maybe at, at that. Right. Well, that's one of the pitfalls. We'll talk about that next session about you know the different types of care. But see, this is also a, a difficult step because we may have done all this work, and again, it could happen in your mind instantaneously. But you did all this deciding that this is what's important to us. Now we have to actually see if it exists, and if it does, what is it going to cost? What is it going to you know? How's it going to work? But if you can find an option that's appropriate, maybe you need to get on some kind of wait list or you call a home care agency because they want to bring somebody to your house, but they don't have anybody for the next three weeks or four weeks, right? So you, you want to try to plan ahead. It's just the more priorities you have in this, the more kind of demands, the more difficult it's going to be to find that option, right? So if everybody magically came together and we all decided these are the priorities. We all still want to talk to each other after. And then, you know, we're ready. Yeah. If, if that list is like 10 things long, we might not find that option. Yeah. So the more you can, you can narrow it down, the more you can decide, cut off, close the door, the faster, the easier it's going to be to find something. And you don't want to even get to this step without knowing what's out there. So that's the next seminar that we have coming up is actually knowing the different types of care facilities out there or care services and all of that, because you don't want to do all that work and jeopardize your whole relationship with your long lost brother that like, you know, if, if you, you did that, but then it turns out that nothing's available for that priority. So that's how it works. Step five, you move forward, you got to take action. And from there, hopefully you're, you've, you, you've got a plan and you've, you've got it covered for that care period. Hopefully the next care period isn't for a while longer because you gotta go through the whole process again. You know, and the trigger could be, you know, mom is taking care of dad, but now she's just got diagnosed with congestive heart failure. And so she can't stay up at night or she can't ambulate. Now we're in another care period. So what are we gonna do, right? Okay, so I know that was, you know, it's, it's kind of a lot of brain power that you got to expend on this. I guarantee you're doing it already in your minds and, and, and it happens instantaneously for us, but it takes brain power to write it down and to be able to explain it to the long lost brother or to your dad who doesn't want to move out of home and that kind of stuff. So um, the more you do it, the easier it will get. And, and really sometimes, it's it's laps us in the face that like these are the priorities budget is like a pretty non-negotiable priority you know black and white you can't afford that the type of care pretty black and white if that is if that's falling all the time and he needs help walking like we already know that maybe some of these options are not going to work or some of our priorities are no longer appropriate because it's not safe um, but it, you know, you'd be surprised by all the little nuances of what people are looking for when it comes to the care, you know, especially when sibling, I, again, in my care home, I welcome families who want to see the facility. We do tours and the types of questions that come up sometimes are very clearly, these are wants and these are needs. <laughs> You know, when somebody focuses too heavily on something that's not really relevant to the care, it's important for me to tell them, like, I know that that's a nice to, or, you know, it's nice to think that um, you're going to be eating restaurant quality food or style food. But like, you know, that's just not something I do at my care home. It's more home style. So, you know, what you're looking for may be kind of like the, the cherry on the top. But is it really, really, really a priority as you're going through this process of thinking about care, right? Or even like the, the reverse, when people want to stay at home, I see this happen a lot. You know, people stay at home and they, maybe they're, they're not aware of the cost, but they just say, my plan is to stay at home and have a private caregiver come by and do all the stuff for me, right? Even if it's not cost, they may not have realized that that's not appropriate because, um, 
where are you going to find this caregiver, which is the current issue with home care, or they might not realize that's an inappropriate thing because, um, you know, there may be dementia involved. And when a stranger comes into the house, then mom is just like really confused by that. So we, this is, this is a real kind of practice trial and error. You might make mistakes along the way, but at least there's this framework. You can ask me questions and all that kind of stuff. Now, um, I did develop one tool that I have on my website, which can maybe streamline this process. It's, it's the, what I think are essential care priorities. And there's really only three. The level of care, or, and, and what that translates to is, is how much assistance does somebody need day and night? Like what kind of assistance, okay? The second one is like, just what can we afford for this care period? And then the third one is like a little bit, tiny little bit about personal preferences in terms of the size of that either facility or the size of the care arrangement. If I'm at home, then it's a very small size. I'm the only person receiving care there, or maybe me and my spouse. Other places, you know, I might be one of five, one of 10, one of 120. And so with those three things, I, I've come up with this. Um, what am I saying here? Oh, so this is the website in general. And I, I think most of you registered for this on the website, so you've already seen it. But Kupuna Care Pair is this website that really, my goal is to demystify this whole process for everybody. Just kind of get out all these issues and to, to think about it in advance, but also save your time. And maybe hopefully if I, you know, if I pray, save your relationships with your loved ones, with your, maybe they're not your loved ones, but they're your relatives. And then, you know, whatever it could be, right? Um, and saving you that time and energy and money by simplifying this whole process, simplifying what's out there, or knowing what's out there, comparing the options, and then really being able to connect to actual care providers that do that. You know, they, they, they are part of those options. So I have these different things. Um, the self-service quiz is what I'm gonna talk about briefly. But this knowledge base, you know, what we're talking about now is, is kind of part of that. Um, I have a whole description about the different types of care facilities and services, which this is going to be our next seminar. And then the elderly care marketplace, which is like, a, um, like you know, when people buy and sell houses or when you book a, a hotel online or something like that, there's listings of different care providers. And right now it's only care re residential facilities. But, um, you know, Leona, we talked about maybe having physical therapists on there or, or different types of services on there. And right? so I'm, I'm kind of growing it. But this is a way to then say very quickly, okay, I need a facility and this is my budget. So I don't want to pay more than this. I need a vacancy now. I want a private bedroom. I um, need to be able to bring my cat and clicking all these buttons and then narrowing down all the different options until you get to just a short list. And then you call them, right? So that's what this whole thing is, the marketplace. But let's focus on the self-service quiz, which is um, quickly and identifying what might be appropriate for your situation when you're looking for an actual care service. Now, again, the, the, the three things are um, how much assistance and what kind of assistance, not like into in depth, but assistance like in terms of hours a day maybe in terms of is it supervision versus you know just kind of watching after somebody or is it actually hands-on care right so how much assistance is needed is the first one second category it it takes into consideration is um the budget for the next three to five years i just assume that the next care period is three to five years but you can use it for you know i mean you, you can assume whatever time frame you need and then the last one is really looking at what size is most appropriate uh, size of this setting is it going to be the home setting is it going to be a small little residential place is it going to be a big assisted living so those three things those three factors um you can take this quiz it's multiple choice so i'm not collecting any details about you your loved one anything like that and and that's how like impersonal this can be you know when you're going through this steps you get all this emotion involved, but if you remove 
yourself from you know that personal history and whatever i mean you can accomplish this on a on a, a multiple choice quiz but it doesn't take into consideration dad wanting to stay at home it doesn't take into consideration that mom has congestive heart failure it doesn't um you know take into consideration those things it's it's a quiz based on those three categories and in just about eight questions at most it can spit out like 30 some different possibilities but the the key is it's it's eliminating and cutting back the options that are available to you based on those three things it's not saying well you know mom you know you you, you have this attribute and you have that attribute and let's come up with the perfect situation rather it's it's like step five where we're um where we're searching for appropriate options and how does that match with what you're looking for there's really only like nine types of care in the whole state home care daycare care homes uh, uh nursing homes independent living assisted living hospice a couple others like that's it that's all we have and so using those three um criteria we i i'm i'm hopefully narrowing down of those nine just which one is most appropriate based on that budget you're talking about or based on the the level of assistance that dad needs overnight if dad can walk at home and and he just needs to be supervised that's going to spit out one option versus if dad really needs to be hands-on you know for more than let's say four to eight hours a day it's going to spit out a different option um this isn't the end all be all it's it's just a tool for you to use but you can use it now to just kind of gauge well what really is out there before i get into all this stuff and negotiations with my family and siblings um about priorities let me just see like really what are the options because sometimes you really only have one or two options it could be because of budget it could be because of um level of care it could be because you really need i mean the the, the payment is going to be medicare which is like health insurance you know health insurance doesn't cover for most of long-term care so like all of this long list of priorities may really be irrelevant if I only have to, you know, I can only look at one place. Let's say I can only, I mean, the one of the hardest situations to look for care is to be only depending on SSI or supplemental social income, right? Maybe one or two types of services available for that, and that's it. So all the priority and everything else is, is like, they become the nice to have, the wants. Um, so this is on the website now www.kupunacarepair.com. It's, it's on the materials and everything. And you can take the quiz over and over and over again. You know, for this care period, for future care periods, um, it will spit out an answer. And then if you, if you wanna learn more about the answer, there's a description on the whole other part of the website. Um, okay, so that's kind of what I got. I, I, um, I said this the last two seminars, I'm saying it again, I can't believe you're drinking out of this fire hose but it's being recorded so you can watch it again and, and you know, kind of go through it slowly if you need to. Um, if you didn't pick up one already, there's an evaluation form in the back and please do, you know, fill it out and, and note there's two sides to it. Um, if you wanna give some positive feedback, that would be great. We can send it on over to elderly affairs division for them to continue this. Um, if you wanna do it online, on my website, this is the link, or if you take a picture of this you know, QR code, you could do it that way too. And um, our next seminar is not till August, we'll take a break next month. And so introduction to elderly care options, this is gonna be just the, the, the high level overview of like everything we have in the state, home care, daycare, assisted living, independent living, you know, all those things and the pros and cons to each one of those. Um, I'm a big fan of just sharing what I know of being in the industry, you know, that it's, there's no one best place. I mean, like, it, it's really per each person's situation. And then August 26 is the last seminar in this series of extending care at home. You know, what are the tips? What are some of the hidden costs? How do you strategize this? Um, that's also a very important topic. And then I have some other seminars that are unscheduled. I think it will be for 2024. 
um, pitfalls to avoid when you're working with caregivers, managing the cost, fitting in with the cool kupuna, which is basically kind of about like, you know, how do you, how do you, what are some best tips to work well with people in the facility in a, you know, another care facility and not just being at home. Um, okay, so that's it for my talk, but I'm totally open to answer questions, uh, thoughts about your individual situations, if you want to bring it up now or afterwards. Um, any questions or seminars? Magnificent. Magnificent. Well, thank